Välkomna alla. I would like to welcome you all to 3PSC Sunday Zoom where we usually have our conversation about the principles in Swedish. With that said, today we have an international guest and we'll have our conversation in English. When we open up for questions and sharing, you can ask and share in both English and Swedish. We will translate your question. This webinar is being recorded and you can find the recording on 3PSC's YouTube channel. Well, I'm so glad to welcome my friend Marina Galan to 3PSC's Sunday Zoom. She lives in Cuerratero, Mexico, with her three sons. Marina is an inspiring speaker, leader, and coach, and is a firm believer that the understanding of the three principles of the human experience has the power to transform any life, making well-being and mental peace sustainable. She dedicates her life to spending this understanding in any way, spreading this understanding in any way she can. Marina is a woman who walked the talk. She is the founder of 3P ESP, a multi-platform program that shares the three principles understanding with the Swedish speaking community worldwide. She is a part of the 3PGC board. She co-runs the 3PC international community with Natasha Swedlov. She has translated the missing link into Spanish. I can keep going on, but I think it's best to let Marina start and dive into today's topic, how to find peace of mind in turbulent times. You're welcome, Marina. Oh. <laughs> We can't hear you, Marina. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Hello again. Hello. Um, I was saying that it's always funny to, to listen to someone else introduce you like that talk about you like that <laughs> no it yeah. kind of places you on the spot and and I don't know if this happens to you but sometimes like when you go through what you actually have done you yourself are surprised and are like oh yeah I've done all that it doesn't really feel like that on a on a 24-7 basis mm. but I guess that's just part of the human experience as well Anyway, thank you for having me here. It's it's really, truly an honor. I see old friends, very dear old friends, and uh, not so old friends, more like new friends. And I see people that I have never seen before. So it's always very exciting to meet new people that are in any way, shape, or form excited about this understanding and about sharing the good news that it brings. Anyway, uh, how to have peace of mind in turbulent times was the topic chosen for today's talk. And I was uh, just telling my hosts before they opened the room that I didn't know when, when the theme was chosen how appropriate it would be to my current circumstances. And so I am, I am surprised and somehow humbled by the whole thing because I have been in a way forced to really reflect on how to have sustainable peace of mind in turbulent times. And um, as Kenny was saying, when you really walk the talk, you cannot allow yourself to get distracted. You cannot allow yourself to look the other way and, and, and play the fool. So let's see where this leads us. Yes, thank you for being here. Thanks everyone for being here. It's a, it's a real treat. So what do I mean when I say that this understanding makes peace of mind sustainable? What this understanding points to is the fact that 
the way the system, the way the human system is designed, we go in and out of our perceived well being. So sometimes we experience peace and mental clarity and peace of mind, and sometimes we don't. Now, I was talking to someone yesterday and uh, we were exploring how it is never voluntary, right? I mean, who gets out of peace voluntarily? Nobody ever brings themselves out of peace voluntarily. But it happens. We do innocently with our thinking. Now, thank God, coming back to peace is not up to us. Because if it were up to us, my God, we would, we would be in so much trouble. So the system takes care of that part every time we allow it to. Every time we voluntarily, that yes, let go of our thinking, the system brings us back immediately to well-being and mental peace. And so the question, of course, becomes, what does let go of your thinking mean? How do I do that? Because it feels impossible when we are caught up in our thinking. Thoughts become sticky, like a spider web, and you can't really get rid of them. The more you try, the more tangled up you become. And so in this exploration that I was having yesterday, we really looked at how we have the ability to not touch our thoughts, not engage with the thoughts that are showing up in our mind, in our consciousness. So thinking can be happening kind of in a back burner, but we don't need to touch that thought. So what is the feeling that comes to you when I say, don't touch that thought. What is the image that comes to your mind? Like you can see it, you can be aware of it, but you don't need to touch it. You don't need to make it personal. You don't need to establish a relationship between yourself and the thought or the thinking. When you don't touch that thought, because it is receiving no energy whatsoever, because it is not being fed, because it is not being sustained in any way. The mind needs to bring something else to the table. So let's look, let's look a little at this a little bit from the physical, physiognomical side of what happens in the brain. So we have the neural paths that are um, very common to us, our habitual neural paths, our habitual thinking. And because they are habitual, those are the easiest options that our mind is going to present to us at any given moment. So here you go. It's like, it's like being a regular in a restaurant. And as soon as you get there, the waiter says, oh, here's your burger. Because you've been having burgers for the last 40 second, 42 years, right? So here's your burger. When I say, don't touch that burger, don't touch that thought, I don't mean fight that thought or reject that thought. Because as we were saying, the more you interact with it, the stickier it becomes. So in a way, it's like saying to the waiter, AKA the mind, oh, thank you. I don't really feel like a burger today. What else can you have? Can you bring me? And so it must bring something else, you see, because you're ordering it to. So it will go, fetch something else, bring it to the table. And you can say, oh, no, I'm not really in the mood for salad either. What else can you bring me? And it has to keep bringing you new things. So what happens? Does this make sense so far? Yes? OK, cool. So what happens when we are in turbulent times and we freak out? Because we do. We freak out. We forget, it's very simple. We just forget that, it, that the waiter is taking orders from us. And then we start 
binge eating through anything he gives us. <laughs> you see, we gobble down the burger and the salad and whatever it brings us. Now, here's the beauty of the whole thing. And I am going to try to connect what we're saying now with what we were saying before about, thankfully, the system is in charge of bringing us back. When we are binging through our thoughts, through our habitual thoughts, through our panic thoughts, wisdom will pull up a signal to invite us to let go, to stop touching that thought. And that signal is our feelings. Now, this is really counterintuitive in the world we, we have grown up in because we've always been directed in the opposite direction. So I want to tell you a little story about uh, something that happened to me a few weeks ago in which I really could see the whole thing happening live. Yes? So... Um, my mother had been... I have a 83-year-old mother and she has emphysema in her lungs and it's very advanced and so she has a lot of trouble breathing and uh, she had had a couple of really rough days um, and of course... When she can't breathe, her thinking goes wild, and then she gets really nervous and worked up, and she goes into a panic, and that allows her lungs to close even more. See, so she can't, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. Yes? So anyway, I had been with her for, I don't know, a day and a half, trying to calm her down, trying to help her breathe, etc., and for... A few times in those hours, um, she was about to die. She was she was really going, and she was holding onto my hands like this. <laughs> she couldn't breathe, and she couldn't breathe, and she would look at me straight in the eyes, and her tears would start streaming down her face, and I could see her panicking. Now. It was incredibly tempting to follow my panic thinking, my own panic thinking in the moment. But it made no sense at all. So I had that pause, that bit of a moment there in saying, how, how would that be helpful at all? Nothing, yes? And so I was able to meet her panic with absolute calm and absolute peace. And I could see her calming down. Now, fast forward a few hours. And we are calling an ambulance because she can't breathe anymore. And she wants to rush to the hospital. And the paramedics are coming in, all rushing through. And as the paramedics rush through, she is even more panicked. And, and so she doesn't want them to take her. And she starts pulling the mask off. And she's fighting the paramedics and hitting them and so they need to sedate her which takes her into a respiratory arrest and then they start you know PCRing her and we are in the ambulance rushing through the streets of Querétaro at 175 kilometers an hour the siren is blaring my mother is in the back her IV explodes there's blood everywhere and I again could feel different times the panic arising, right? But when we understand, and this is where the understanding comes into, into, the, into the game, when we understand what that panic is bringing, which is an invitation to let go and allow the system to bring you back to what is useful, to what is optimal, because that's the thing, the understanding points to the fact that the system will bring you back to what is optimal to deal with the situation. So it is not always necessarily shanti shanti loving peace. It can be something completely different. So we will go into that. 
but hold on. So I can feel the panic, right? And of course, logically, it makes absolute sense to panic, but from the understanding, it doesn't make any sense to panic. I am sitting in an ambulance with the driver, rushing through the streets, panic is not a good idea. And so I keep turning to the driver and I keep telling him, oh, yeah, I can see you like strong emotions. And he's looking at me and he's asking me, what, how are you so calm? How, how on earth can you be having this kind of conversation with me? And I'm like, no, yes, don't worry, just drive, you know, everything is okay. And I'm calming the paramedics down and everything is, so in the end, we get to the hospital. The driver from the ambulance asks me for my card because, you know, I, I need to understand how you do this. And, and, but every time he asked me, the only answer I had was, well, it makes no sense to panic. It makes no sense to panic. It's not useful under these circumstances. Now, what would be another kind of circumstance where absolute peace would not be optimal? If a dog is attacking your child, you don't wanna be peaceful and shanti shanti. You wanna have a different kind of energy in order to deal with that, you see? But the energy does not come from panic. It comes from clarity of what is needed. And that clarity of what is needed comes from peace of mind. So you see the difference? Peace of mind, agreement with reality, information from wisdom, optimal response. If I had been driving the ambulance, I could not have been shanti shanti peace because my senses needed to be way more alert. Right? So the system brings us back to the optimal state to deal with the circumstances when we allow it to. Is this making sense so far? Yes? Okay, I see a few faces going like this, so good. Now, when we say turbulent times, we are not necessarily referring to two hours where I was rushing my mother to the hospital and dealing with this. We are talking about an ongoing difficult circumstance, you know, throughout days or months or years. Thankfully, the system doesn't get tired and need to, needs to rest. It is working perfectly 24 seven, regardless of what is going on, regardless of whether we are tired or not, angry or not, scared or not, sad or not. It is always, always working perfectly. And so it has a continuous invitation to the perfect response, the optimal response, which is a continuous invitation to peace of mind and clarity. Quiet mind and clarity. So what does quiet mind mean? There is no noise. We all have the experience of a noisy mind, yes? The noise, if you give yourself the chance to look at it, it mostly comes from being in disagreement with what is. So when I am not in agreement with what is, mental noise, things should be different. This should not be happening. Uh, he should be driving differently. My mother should be breathing. They should have put the, the VI differently. Uh, I don't know anything. The dog should not be attacking my kid. Yes, but it is. So you need to come to terms with what is in order to be able to respond to it optimally. When you come to terms with what is, then there is a quiet mind. There are endless accounts of people in, in war when they are out in duty and they are being attacked and bombarded and all that. And all, every single time, 
what they say is you do not feel the fear while you are under attack. There is always clarity and, and, and a quiet mind. It's only after the attack that you, then your mind begins to go everywhere and then you can experience fear or anger or sadness or whatever. But during the attack, there's always presence. And presence implies agreement with what is. So you see, even in those moments, the system has your back. It's taking care of you. It's bringing you to no mental noise. So let's talk about what happens afterwards. Now that things, the danger is over. And now our minds are free to work themselves up. And they do. It's human. But again, we have the gift of the alarm system. Hey, you might not be thinking optimally. You might not be looking at this optimally. How do you know when you're feeling fear, when you're feeling anger, when you're feeling... All these things are just an invitation to check back on how you are relating to your thinking. Because sometimes it's, sometimes it is the content of the thinking, but sometimes it's just how you are relating to it. You know, in very, very ridiculously simple terms, I can think that I am beautiful or that I am ugly, it doesn't matter. What matters is how I relate to that thinking, to that thought. Whether I take it seriously or not, whether I validate it or not, whether I... Going beyond the content and even beyond the habitual thinking, the noise in the head. Have you seen little babies, how they are continually in experience? Like they don't stop, they are experiencing everything, yes? And so we know that there is thinking going on in the back, right? Now, as we grow into adults, for whatever reason, we cannot understand thinking, but in terms of language. Like, can you think of a thought and not think of it in terms of language? You can't. There's always a story. And yet babies and little kids don't necessarily have language and they are growing, going through the motions of experience. So what does this point to? The principle of thought. It's not in the form, so it cannot be in language. Thought is just an energy moving through us. And then our minds tell the story of what that might mean, you see? So this means that my mother is in danger and that the paramedics are assholes and that this should be happening differently. That's the story my mind is making up. The, the thought is just energy passing through. And so when we, we, when we start exploring the principles and uh, we, we get really interested in thought, we get very interested in looking at the content of thought, yes? Oh, because I was thinking that. Oh, because I was thinking this and in that way. And in, instead of just realizing that that type of energy, regardless of the story, forget the story. The energy that is fun is creating an experience and the experience itself is letting us know how we are relating to that energy, what we are making up about it. So, Sid Banks says, this is important guy, Sid Banks says, all the information you know is in the feeling. He didn't say 
80% of the information you need is in the feeling. No, he said, all the information you know you need is in the feeling, all of it. Listen to the feeling. Find a good feeling and let it guide you. Now, when we allow ourselves to experience a feeling and we do not touch the story that our mind makes up about it, we allow it to inform us in a completely different way. Because here's the thing, the rational mind does not talk feelings. It can't. It can make up a story about it, but it doesn't talk the language of feelings. Feelings are decoded or information is brought out of feelings by a completely different intelligence in us. The rational always limits it to a tiny little story that might or might not be true. So when we don't touch the story, when we don't touch the thought, and we let ourselves feel, the feeling will take us where we need to go. We, through this understanding, have the enormous opportunity to become intimate with our wisdom, to become intimate with our feelings, to learn their language, to learn how it is that they are guiding us, to learn to trust them beyond the rational has nothing to do with the rational. You know, when you have an intimate relationship with someone, it is not rational, is it? It has to do with the feeling. It has to do with how you feel them and how they can feel you and how that communication happens beyond this. I was at the bank a couple of days ago and these two women that work there, they would just look at each other and they would know, like they would give each other orders just by it was like so beautiful to see but it, it had nothing to do with language it had nothing to do with rational it was immediate it was just feeling so this understanding gives us the enormous opportunity to really become intimate with our feelings learn their language learn to be guided learn to trust them it's the same as saying we become intimate with wisdom. Do you see what I mean? Turbulent times are, a, are an incredibly difficult challenge for the rational mind because we really want to figure them out. Yes, we really want to solve them. And we can't. Because most challenges are not there to be figured out or solved. They're there to be experienced. And a lot of the times, when we give ourselves permission to experience them, we don't solve them, but they dissolve through experiencing. So when you let yourself feel, it dissolves. A very good friend of mine died yesterday. And uh, I could see my mind reacting to it. I could see my mind getting angry and getting sad and uh, getting upset and looking at her 19 year old daughters and thinking how unfair it all was and getting worried about them and, and thinking about her poor husband who this year lost 
his father, his sister, his dog, his, and his wife. I mean, come on, right? What's that about? Turbulent times. You cannot solve this. You can't. We cannot solve war. We can't. We cannot solve loss. We can fight it. Or we can experience it. And let our system, because I don't know how to call it, our heart, suck all the information it needs out of that experience so that it can grow larger and meet experiences anew from a more compassionate, more loving space. We hold experience. When you meet people that are, I don't know how, how the expression would work in English, but in Spanish we say a lot, he's dehumanized. When, when people cannot feel you, when they cannot feel empathy, when they cannot understand, we say they are dehumanized. Yes. So when we do not grow our hearts, our souls large enough to contain the experience of another or our own, we lose the opportunity to be more human to be more ourselves. When we fight with this, we lose the opportunity for this to happen. Now this man, boy, does it hurt. But there is no other way to widen your heart, to widen your soul than to really truly allow yourself to feel the experience. But we are terrified of feeling. We are terrified of really, truly immersing ourselves in the experience. Why? Because we have grown up and lived in a world that teaches us that those experiences need to be expressed by being projected onto the outside. And that is not true. So if I allow myself to feel anger, I will probably go and hit someone, break them, their nose, kill them. Uh, if I allow myself to feel sadness, I will end up depressed and not get out of bed for the next four months. If I allow myself to feel grief, I will never, ever recover from it and be able to meet the world anew. And so we learn to be terrified of experiencing, of feeling. And we are desperate to find a solution here. Now see how finding a solution here is always rejection on some level. We do not allow ourselves to feel. I was reading <laughs> this morning a comic with one of my sons and the character said, if you do not allow yourself to feel, you feel no pain. Is that true though? Well, you might feel not pain. You might not feel pain, but oh my God, your world is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. And there is nothing more painful than that. So what being human asks of us is to feel, to experience. You see, life is not stupid. Life is not dumb. It would not let, if, if what life asks of us is experience, it's gonna make sure we have experience. It's not gonna let us go through life being able to somehow avoid it. And we can't, you see, nobody can avoid experience. Nobody can. It, this is what happens. But, but when we meet experience like this, 
we grow into something completely different than when we made experience in surrender. We grow inwards. We allow for more. We become larger. We expand. We become more human. We understand. We empathize. We hold. We become companions for others. We don't need to rescue them from their experience. But we can love them through them. We can walk with them through them. When you allow yourself to feel fully, truly, completely, that feeling guides you where you need to go. In the understanding that it is about this and not about out there. Then you let it do the work inside. The work of the heart, which is mysterious. Sid said, all is love and mystery. Period. Love and mystery. There's nothing else. And when you can make mystery with love, oh my God. Oh my God. I was talking to my mother's friend yesterday at the funeral and uh, she told me, I can't go through this, but I know God will take me through it. I am in absolute surrender. I spent the last week with my father. He's 94. He's very weak. He had a, a nasty fall last week and uh, he's been recovering very, very slowly. And um, I could see him try to fight it with his head because he has been the strong guy for his whole life. And he's so proud of himself and his strength and his. And yet he is having to surrender. He's having to surrender to his own weight, to being helped, to humility. And I could see him go in and out of it, in and out of it, in and out of it. And I could see how as soon as he let go, the system would bring him back. And he was pleasant and funny and charming and joyful. The lack of peace comes from disagreement. It comes from rejection. I know you have all had the experience of <clears throat> being okay with being sad or being okay with being angry. So the problem is not the sadness or the anger. It's the being okay or not being okay with it. Turbulent times imply raging, magnificent storms inside us. But we have the ability to surrender to that. We have the ability to surrender in the unknown and not only surrender to the unknown, but thrive in it. We were, we were designed to thrive in the unknown. Look at babies, they don't know anything. They are being woken up, changed, taken someplace, changed again, put into water, brought back, fed, they are, they are just going with it. 
They don't know shit, but they're thriving. They're not stressed. They're not stressed because they're not rejecting it. I mean, they just came into a world that is completely alien to them from darkness into light, from silence into sound, from being by themselves to being surrounded by people all the time. It's insane when you think about it. They don't have a problem with it because they're not fighting it. And so they thrive. So if babies are designed to thrive in the unknown, we are too. It's just that we've grown accustomed to control or the illusion of control. So I remember when my kids were little and everybody would tell me, no, you have to follow a schedule and always the same thing one after the other. So the baby knows what's coming and that will make them feel calm and everything will be predictable. They didn't have a problem with nothing being predictable, but I was forcing that into them and then they would get into predictability. And then if I take predictability out, then they would feel stressed, you see? So peace in turbulent times comes from the recognition of our design. The recognition that that mental peace is perfectly possible and not only perfectly possible, optimal to deal with turbulent times. We human beings cannot not choose the best option we see. We are not designed for choosing the second best option, you see? If we choose the second best option is because we see some sort of plus in it. Isn't that true? We always, always choose the best option we see. So peace in turbulent times becomes possible when we see it as the best option in turbulent times. It's as simple as that. So yeah, agreement with the reality. Embracing of what is, not fighting anything. Peace of mind, clarity, feeling being guided, perfect. You see how simple it is? There's so little for us to do. It's just a recognition of it. The recognition that the system, if we allow it, will guide us. The recognition that we can trust it. That's a very important one. But we can. If our design was up to us, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Thank God it's up to universal wisdom. So we can trust it because it's not us and the universe, us and life, us and wisdom, us and nature. No, it's all the same thing. We are nature, we are life, we are wisdom. We are intelligence, so we can trust that. Our intellect came way, way, way later. It's tiny and it only has, uh, not even your age. I mean, come on. <laughs> beware, beware <laughs> of thinking that it can know more than life, than the design, than the intelligence that you are a part of that the wisdom that you are part of. Peace is always the invitation. Surrender to it. That's all you have to do. I think that's it. <laughs> I'd love to hear what you guys have to say or what you guys are hearing or if there are any comments or questions. Yeah, thank you, Marina. That's lovely. You. If you have any questions, just raise your hands and we have something to share. I 
I see Ricard. I don't know how to pronounce your name, Ricard. Yes, Ricard. Uh, that's right, Richard, you can say. Okay, thank you. But I, I... <laughs> <laughs> I just have one question. You said that um, um, <clears throat> we have to, to learn to know our feelings and uh, accept them. But doesn't the feeling come from the thought? And the, okay. th and the thought isn't anything if you look at it. Okay, so here's how it looks to me, okay? The feeling gives you information about the thought. It is a real-time feedback system of what you are doing with your thinking. Because as I said, I am ugly, can feel horrible one day, and it can feel completely irrelevant another day. So it's not the content of the thought per se. You see? It's what I am doing with that energy, what I am doing with the story of that energy. If I am believing it, if I am not believing it, if I am turning it into a problem or not turning it into a problem or... So yesterday at the funeral, my friend, you could hear everyone say, such a shame. She was so young and her kids are so young and what is going to become of them and the worry of the father. But, at this, but two minutes later, you could hear the same people saying, thank God she left. She was suffering so much. She was in so much pain. So we are all talking about death. But you can look at this part of death or this part of death or this part of death or this part of death or, and what you are doing with it is happening, yes? Now your feelings are giving you information about what you are doing with them. And because they are giving you this valuable information of what you are doing with them, they are incredibly relevant information. So the feeling will let you know whether you are scaring yourself or you are over-congratulating yourself <laughs> or you are worrying yourself or you are angrying yourself, that is what the feeling is going to tell you. You see? And that is an invitation to become conscious of what you're doing so that you can stop doing it or not. So as we become intimate with the language of our feelings, we learn to recognize how they are guiding us how they are letting us know what we are doing. So imagine that you're flying a plane. You see all these, the, 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 the whole thing is filled with instruments, yes? All these instruments are giving you relevant information about what is going on. You want to listen to them, yes? It's the same with feelings. The feelings are letting you know what's going on. You want to listen to them. But if you don't know how to read the instruments, if you don't know what they are talking about, in other words, if you think your feelings are giving you information about the outside world, circumstances, other people, you won't be able to listen to them. As you begin to realize that they are giving you information about what is going on here, then you develop a completely different relationship with your feelings. And you learn their language. And so for when I was in the ambulance heading to the hospital and I could feel panic, I, I could see that I was about to begin scaring myself with my thinking, which was not useful in that circumstance. 
so I could stop doing it. I could let go of the whole thing in an instant. Now, if I am feeling anger when a dog is attacking my kid, I can see that that feeling can be useful right then and there, yes. So I can use that anger to separate the dog or to attack the dog or to whatever. I'm not gonna go and say, oh, hello, little dog, could you please stop biting my kid? It hurts. Do you see, is it useful or is it not useful? Anger is very useful if the dog is attacking my kid. It is not useful if my kid dropped the milk. It is not useful if I am driving in an ambulance with my mother. Fear is incredibly useful if I am being persecuted by a, by a raging dog. Fear is incredibly useful because it will make me run faster. It will bring the blood to my limbs. It, you see? But it's whether it's useful or not. So it's the way you are relating to this thinking useful. And the feeling is an invitation to see whether it is or not. But in order to get to the stage in which you see whether it's useful or not, you have to, I, you have to both be present to the circumstance, to the situation, and allowing yourself to feel completely sucking out the information out of the feeling. Does that make sense, Ricardo? Yeah, but I, I, I got the impression that you had to choose between the feelings. If you have some feelings that comes to you, you have to choose that one and not that one. That's the way I first heard it. Yes, I'm sorry if it sounded that way. No, 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 it's, it's, it's my thinking. <laughs> the feeling is there. You just, you just, it's, it's already there. You don't get to choose whether it shows up or not. You feel it. So you, you don't choose the feeling, you accept the feeling. Yes, because you see, Sid, you, you, Sid Banks said, the feeling guides you. The feeling guides you. So you feel the feeling. Sorry. You feel the feeling and you allow it to guide you to the next stage, whatever that but is. How can it guide you if it's, it's a feeling from a thought that doesn't do any good in that situation? I can think th thoughts like the dog, I, I, I want to hit the dog and maybe that's not uh, the best solution in that situation. And that, that thought creates a feeling, but that feeling doesn't help me. Or... Well, you, well, here's the thing. When you have peace of mind, when you have clarity, you know what is useful and what is not. Okay, okay. That's the whole point. So we talk about peace of mind as if it were a feeling, but it's not a feeling. It's a state of mind, of clarity and presence and agreement with what is. That is peace of mind. Thank you very much. So my friend's husband is going through grief. Grief is, well, I don't know, it's five or eight steps or something like that. And you have anger and negation and um, sadness and all these things. Those feelings are letting you know where you are in your thinking about loss, about having lost someone. So they are giving you useful information of where you are. You see? Clarity. Oh, I am still angry. Is anger useful to lead my teenage daughters in life? Not really. <laughs> you see? But it all depends in the moment. 
So it opens up a new, whole new world of possibilities in terms of allowing those feelings to guide you in the navigation of your thinking. Not only in the navigation of reality, but in the navigation of your thinking as well. One, one question, just one question. You yes. Reality, how do you define reality created by thought or feeling or? Well, what's the temperature where you are, Ricard? About uh, five degrees Celsius. Okay. If you take me there, I will tell you it's freezing and nobody can move. <laughs> yes? Wow. Is it true that it's cold for me? Yes. Is it true that it's cold for you? I don't know. The fact is that it's five degrees. That is reality. Is it cold? Hot. Bearable? Unbearable. Fresh? Uh, possible? Uh, do we want to go outside? Not, that's completely thought created. So the experience of five degrees is thought created. Five degrees is not thought created. Thank God. <laughs> five degrees is not thought created. The death of my friend is not thought created. The fall of my father is not thought created. My mother going into respiratory arrest is not thought created. But the experience of all of these things is thought created. And my feelings allow me to see whether I am in agreement or not, whether I am embracing or not, whether I am rejecting or not. You see? So the feelings are always an invitation to more flow, more grace. More love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. More acceptance. When my father accepts that he's 94, he surrenders more easily. When he doesn't accept that he's 94, he's a pain in the ass. He doesn't let me help him. You see what I mean? Well, agreement with reality and agreement with my experience of reality so that I can move and navigate and play with other experiences of it. Thank you, Ricard. Beautiful question. Cecilia Hector, it's so good to see you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Please don't turn off your camera. I like looking so, at you. Yeah. Oh, this is so beautiful, Marina. Thank you so much for this, um, for this, uh, how you express everything. And uh, it's just how I see it. It's all about the feeling. And, and we are guided from the inside. Yes. And uh, yeah, you just point to, to all, all the things. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. But it, it's, isn't it amazing, Cecilia, how wisdom speaks to us. The language of wisdom is feelings. And we are terrified of them. You see how yeah. illogical that is? Yeah. So the language of wisdom, the way wisdom communicates with us is feelings. Oh my God, we should be binging our feelings you see we should be squeezing the information out of them and like you say we go up and down all the time yes and sometimes we are aware and sometimes not but we yeah. are always guided yes and can come back okay. here's, the thing. here's the thing cecilia what this understanding does it does not save you from the, the human experience, right? No. It doesn't. But it, because it allows you to navigate it differently, you don't need to... Okay, remember how at the very beginning we were saying there is always the invitation to let go so that you can come back to well-being and the system brings you back. So 
we can be incredibly stubborn. And sometimes we need a lot of suffering before letting go and allowing the system to bring us back. What this understanding does, this is gonna sound weird, but bear with me. <laughs> what this understanding does is it makes us incredibly intolerant to suffering. So we do not need this amount of suffering before surrendering and allowing the system to bring us back. We learn to listen to the feeling and we surrender sooner and sooner and sooner. And so we, we still leave well-being. We think ourselves out of it, but we recognize the feeling immediately. And so, ah, no, hold on. Let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back. And so instead of experiencing a life that is <laughs> you just flow here with grace and elegance and beauty because you are I don't mean I don't know about you but I find myself especially in this few last last few weeks I find myself surrendering surrendering 200 times a day it's like oh my god here I go again oh there I was again oh there I was it's just surrender 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 constantly and so it's it might sound paradoxical the fact that we are expanding ourselves to hold more and that at the same time we are <laughs> we are becoming intolerant to suffering but it is actually not a paradox because we are able to hold the space of suffering for others and for ourselves when we find ourselves unable to surrender, to let go. So it's not a paradox because they are on different levels. They are operating on different levels. Our ability to hold the space for it comes from understanding what is causing it? The fact that it's not going to last long. And that we are willing to surrender. And that makes all the difference. The willingness to surrender. There is a Sufi maxim saying, however you want to call it. And it says, stop weaving and see how the pattern improves. And it's really difficult to stop weaving, right? Because we want to do things. We want to make things beautiful. We know we can. Yes. But it's a different kind of weaving when you are weaving from surrender than when you are weaving from ego. Stop weaving. Surrender. See how the pattern improves. Let the universe use you. In order to let the universe use you, in order to let wisdom have its way with you, you have to feel it's the requisite. You can't be guided if you're not willing to feel the guidance because it's the way, it's the language. That is the language. Thank you, Cecilia. Hey, Gunilla. It's so good to see you, my God. So good to oh. see you, my old friend. <laughs> I actually just want to thank you so much for, for today. And it's, uh, it's been just so beautiful and your feeling is so beautiful and love your metaphors and your passion with this it's it's just been a blast to see you and listen to you here and when you talk about the feeling it goes right through the computer window and uh, right to my heart so I just wanted to say thank you thank you Gunilla. thank you
Thank you for being here. Man. I am absolutely convinced that if we knew, if we just knew what feeling can do for us, we would not hesitate. We would not hesitate to surrender to it all. Again, you know, like we were saying right now with Cecilia, it allows life to not be so extreme in the suffering and allows you to just flow in more grace. But at the same time, almost paradoxically, it also allows you to experience the personal fully and completely, you know, prisma color, not black and white, like really. Because because it's beautiful that I am in love with you and not there is love. No, I am in love with you. And I am hurting because my friend died. And I am sad because she was my friend. And do you see the, the beauty of the personal experience? Mm. But then I can experience that hurt for the loss of my friend without the fear of feeling it. Mm. I give myself permission to go there too. So in a really literal sense, this understanding makes us free to feel Mm. anything. It makes us free to think anything without getting tangled up in it, Mm. without getting over-identified with it. Isn't that beautiful though? The freedom it brings. Yeah, it's truly a gift. I know, I know. And it sometimes to the newcomers, to the understanding, it can look like dehumanizing, you know, like uh, it's just your thinking, it's just your thinking, it's just your Mm -hmm. thinking. We don't need to Mm -hmm. feel this, we don't need to do that. When in reality, it's the opposite of it. It's the opposite of that. It's an invitation to (laughs) become more engaged with life while being more detached from it. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Sonny. Hi. Hi, Marina. How are you? I'm, I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. And it's- I'm very uh, glad. It's so lovely to see you and hear your voice. I've heard you many times in in recorded webinars and I've always been so inspired listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we talk, we get to talk live. Yeah, (laughs) that's beautiful. Yes. (laughs) I, I would like to share, um, uh, what call it an, an, an exception but it's not really an exception for how life works, how, how we are designed. Yes. But uh, it really, the experience of it is like it's not working as it should. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and that's very, that, that kind of exception is, is quite um, valuable to, to uh, have an experience about and understanding about. Uh, and and um, I myself, I have a, been to the three principles for several years now and and uh, there's a lot of things that have happened in my life in within myself and without myself and i've been experienced uh, from from you know from really low clarity from really stressful panics 
experience to being in, in, in there now with such love I didn't know it existed to, to experience. Uh, and my resilience has expanded a lot. Uh, and I'm also working as a coach uh, and, and guiding people. But you know, there has been this exception for me. Uh, and um, that has to do with a trauma. Okay. A deep, deep trauma in my life. When I was four years old, a stepfather came into our family and he was a nervous wreck and scared the hell out of me and my brother. So I have always had big, big problems with temper, people having temper. Yes. And you are a woman from Mexico, aren't you? I am. <laughs> Uh, so when 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 this trauma this this is the biggest trauma in my life when that has been triggered that's not a matter of noticing any kind of feelings because it's so high energy there it's so high speed going on there so when that's triggered boom i'm just there huh Yes, I know exactly. Like, like, like kidnapped, yes. totally kidnapped. Nothing, nothing to do. There is no guidance. There is nothing. It's just stuckness. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. But do you know what happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago? Tell me. Wow. I was sitting and, and, uh, and, and listening to, to different uh, three principles in, in webinars, in YouTube, and reading books, etc., deepening my groundings. And when I was sitting there, suddenly, instead of being kidnapped into my deep trauma, I suddenly saw the trauma, what it consisted of, for the first time in 56 years. I actually, for the first time, saw those thought storms, the thoughts. I saw the thoughts. Yes. I saw it, the trauma consisted of thoughts in such high speed. <sighs> it was marvelous because when I saw <laughs> it, I cannot unsee it. Of course. So the, 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 the impact of this trauma now has decreased a lot. There you go. Yeah, it's go. so wonderful. <laughs> oh, Tony, Tony, hold on a second. Hold on, because what you're saying is incredibly important. You cannot see thought and be caught up in it at the same time. Yeah. So when you see thought, you are completely outside of it. Yeah. And then you can see the mind rushing and that very high speed, da 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 but you are having the experience of being outside of it. Yeah. See? So it yeah. not only can decrease, it, it can separate completely yeah. from the, your experience of consciousness. Yeah. Now, I can promise you, I can swear to you, I can assure you that if you keep looking in that direction, it will get better and better and better and better until it disappears and it might show up again every once in a while but the complete the, the experience will be completely different completely different and and when i say i understand you very well i really do my father was incredibly temperamental and violent verbally violent emotionally violent physically violent incredibly violent so I know what it is to respond to temper like that and, and how it engulfs you completely. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, you, there is, it doesn't seem like there is any possibility outside of it, but there is. And you just found that crack. So keep your eyes on that crack. And as long as you keep your eyes on that crack, it, the crack will grow and grow and grow and it will fill 
your experience with divine light, I can promise you that. I really, really can. So the, the exception, <laughs> the exception is a matter of time. Yeah. And the, the beautiful possibility that this understanding brings is the crack. And so now you know the direction in which you need to keep looking. So it's yeah. the direction. You know, they say that once uh, after having been asked a million times, what do we do? Sid finally answered and said, okay, I'm gonna tell you what you need to do. Are you ready? Now listen carefully, because I'm gonna only say this once. Look in a certain direction and do nothing. But look in a certain direction. That's what he said. So what is the direction? What is going on inside? So you are not responding to someone's temper. You are responding to everything you learned about that, which is not out there. It is in here. And so that... response, that trauma response is guiding you to look in there. What have you done with your thinking to this experience in the past and how that is informing your experience now? But it is this way, always, always, always this way because it is giving information about what you are doing with your thinking, not about how you need to deal with the temper, about what is going on here. Now, we will always have blind spots, yes, always. So for you, the blind spot has been how to deal with temper. And at some other point in your life, we will talk in, in in a couple of years, and you will have a completely different blind spot. But as long as you can keep looking in that direction, those blind pots, spots will keep dissolving one after the other, after the other, after the other. And you will keep having this experience of expansion and growth and, and possibility inside you. I know this. I know this because this has been my story as well not only with temper, with sexual abuse as well. So my story of man for 40 something years was hell. It was a hell that you had to put up with, that you had to get yourself go through because you know, life is full of men. But my, the possibility of ever trusting a man was not available to me until very recently. Like really, truly trusting, like resting in the presence of a man, in the intimacy of a man, surrendering. It was an exception, believe me. It's not anymore. But you have to keep looking in that direction. Because your feeling is telling you about your trauma. And if you let the feeling guide you, it will show you how to dissolve the trauma so that you can make space for it and integrate it. And then you can meet temper from a completely different space. Or men, in my case, or whatever. <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> I am so thrilled for your crack. I am so thrilled that you saw it. Because like you say, you can't unsee it now. And from that moment on, that crack will open, open, open up and an avalanche of light will come through to inform you. I, I know you, you, you are, you are, you are you're telling me the truth because I, I experienced this truth myself. I've been doing all the th thinking that you are 
expressing I have myself. So I've, I've been letting my psyche or mind, whatever, uh, clean, 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 and going deeper and deeper. And it does it automatically. And, you know, when, what, I, what I have seen and understood uh, when it comes to cleaning uh, deep traumas is that the, the grounding via the understanding of the three principles, one of the biggest value, it has a lot of value, of course, but one of the biggest value when it comes to cleaning traumas is the, the depth of, of security and safety I have felt when I'm grounded more and more. And that has made the psyche cleaning more and more, seeing, looking more and more, until for two weeks ago, it was so big, it has gone down so big, that cleaning has been, and that, and that resilience was so big. So now suddenly I could notice what was going on. Perfect. It's, it's so beautiful and it continues. I just let it continue, clean yes. more and more, and there will be like, like uh, I don't know what you see, uh, dominant effects. Yes. Other Dominate. traumas, other things, uh, um, um, limited possibility, limited, um, uh, what do you call it? Begins and over to you, sir. Limited, uh, what do you say know. that in English? Begins and over to you, sir. Limited convention. Or? Limited beliefs. Ah. Uh -huh. And other limited beliefs going on in my subconscious yes. will also dissolve. There's a lot of domino effects. So I, I, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. And what you're saying, the level of safety and security, that can only come from surrendering. You see? So the more you surrender, the safer you feel. And the safer you feel, the more you surrender. It's a virtuous cycle. There's no rush. You'll find your pace. You will be guided through this. Mm. Congratulations, Sonia. I'm so, so happy for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. Perfect. Perfect. You see, turbulent times for 56 years. Man. I know. And yet the invitation is always there. Peace of mind. Clarity. Quiet. Let, let life do you. Let wisdom do you. <laughs> and it's so simple. It's so simple. Just recognize the possibility of it. Thank you so much, Marina. This has been truly amazing. And uh, to speak with such a clarity and, and simplicity. And, uh, well, I hope it was clear enough. Sometimes it didn't feel very clear in my head as I was speaking. <laughs> but I'm, mm. glad it, I'm glad it was clear enough out there. <laughs> such a great example and everything. So, and, and and also, I mean, when you when you share your own story and, and what you've been up to lately, I mean, it yeah, it yeah. really shows hope for us all. And I was always also thinking that that the system it's not just enough; it's in everybody. And to see that when you meet a person that are suffering or are in turbulent times, yeah. that's also a gift. That's such a gift. To see that and helpful it is and can i can i add something do we have time can i add something yeah. else yeah sure sure yes okay here it goes so 
because with my father and my mother, all that is happening now, you know, like the, the downward spiral of, of their end, the end of their life, you kind of have an idea of what is coming. So you can somehow imagine what's coming. With my friend, there is no imagining. Like, you know, well, this is it. Yes. Now, let me tell you, let me add another piece of my turbulent times to you. Are you ready? My best friend has been in a coma for the last three weeks. Nobody knows why. They found him unconscious and having seizures in his brain. And so he has been in the hospital, intubated, and they've been running all kinds of tests and they are finding nothing. And he didn't have medical insurance. So me and all our friends, we are gathering money for him and his family to be able to cover the cost of the hospitals and all these things. Now, this has really made me wonder about consciousness. You know, because it's funny here in Mexico, throughout the years with the drug cartels and all that, sometimes you hear a lot about missing people, you know, they just disappear and, and they're looking for them. Well, my friend is missing. Nobody knows where he is. You see, we know where his body is, but we don't know where he is. Mm. And, and how, how, where the consciousness of his body, the, the doctors tell us, no, maybe he can hear you, maybe he can feel your touch, maybe, he can, but he's just disappeared. And so I'm thinking about consciousness a lot. And that has brought me 360 around to my experience of consciousness about him and where he is. And all I can see in my mind imagining where he could be, whether he will come back or not, whether he will wake up or not, whether he will have brain damage or not, how we will deal with the, his brain damage or not, whether he will need um, physiotherapy to learn to talk again or walk again. Or, but it is all in the unknown all of it and so it's so interesting to have all these things happening in my life at the same time and it's like everywhere I look I am bumping against the limits of my understanding it's like this is way above my pay grade this is way I can't I can't know how to deal with this but like my mother's friend was saying my like my friend's mother was saying yesterday I cannot navigate this I would have no idea how to do it. But I am being guided. And if I follow that guidance, I will get through it. You see? So it's one step at a time. Just the one step you have right in front of you. That's as far as guidance goes. Wisdom knows everything that is ahead but it works like a like a short lights on your car in darkness you know it doesn't it doesn't illuminate the whole world you can only see 2 meters ahead of you but that's all the information you need this now what makes sense oh this is what makes sense next step we stop we go back we look around we let reality inform us oh next step one more step you see? And you know that as long as you keep yourself there, you'll be okay. So there is no need to scare yourself, worry yourself, anger yourself with your thinking. There is no need to do that. None at all, whatsoever. Because you don't know. And you either trust the perfection of life or you don't. There's no in between. So you surrender again, again, and again to what shows up. That's all we can do. Yeah. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the, the unknown was an important piece of it. Thank you for <laughs> letting, me, letting me that. I, yeah. I saw Hannah had her hand open. Anna? Uh, Hannah had her hand open, yeah. Yes. Yes, I had, but I was conscious about the time. Do you have the time for one last? I have the time for one more. Yeah, I, I get it. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marina, for this night. It was lovely. But a question that arised in me was when you and Sonny were talking about cleaning out traumas. Yes. Yes. Can you say something else about that? Because I, I thought the trauma was more like a memory. Okay. Uh, isn't it like and, seeing and a memory it in a different way? Or Say that again? Isn't it like seeing a memory in a different way? Can you say it like that? Uh, <clears throat> so. Okay, here we go. There is thinking that is live in the moment, like what I am thinking right now. And then there is my system of beliefs. Yes. And my system of, of beliefs works like filters through which I experience reality. So if I live in a country in which having blue eyes is dangerous, I will see everybody that has blue eyes and experience fear and try to hide and run the other way. Yes? Yeah. Now, that memory, like you named, like you called it, is alive in me as a belief system. Yes? Yeah. So the filter allows me to see things and not see other things. Now, one of the things this set of beliefs, that system of thinking does, is it fixes an experience of something. So imagine for the sake of the conversation, Hannah, that my grandmother used to dress up as a palm tree to scare me every night. Okay? Okay. Now, I grow up with a trauma around palm trees. And every time I see a palm tree, I experience anguish and fear and I can't breathe. And please don't take me to the beach ever. Yes. Okay. Now, that memory is true. Well, it's not, but it could be true. <laughs> Let's imagine that it's true. So that memory is true. And so within my story, the fear of palm trees is justified. And anyone I tell the story to will say, well, of course, she's afraid of palm trees. Of course, she experiences palm trees from anguish and despair. Now, as a human being, Every way a palm tree has ever been experienced or will ever be experienced in the history of humanity is a possibility for me. But I have fixed my experience of palm trees because of a memory that created a trauma response. Yes? Yeah. Now. As long as that belief system of palm trees are scary is valid in me, I will experience palm trees that way. But the truth is that if I am able to crack that belief, question that belief, get curious about that belief and say, huh, well, I don't, I don't really know. Could palm trees be experienced in a different way? Like, what if they could? Like, I don't know. Let's see. And I can go outside today and slowly approach a palm tree and, and see what I experience. But do you see? So it's not looking at a memory in a different way. Is shedding a belief around something that is dictating my experience in the present. So the memory of my grandmother scaring me is dictating now my experience of palm trees. If I shed that psyche, if I shed that belief, if I shed that experience, if I allow myself to expose myself to palm trees again without that belief present, I could discover different possibilities, not one, millions and millions and millions of possibilities of how to experience a palm tree. So trauma is 
a memory that was so intense that it fixed a certain experience as the only possibility for you. Men are dangerous. <laughs> Men are not trustworthy. Men, do you see? But what if we can approach men differently? What if we can have a completely different experience of temper or power or palm trees or sex? If we don't question, there is no crack that will begin to open and shedding that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And and I think that maybe we start to questioning because we suffer, right? Exactly. So the suffering is the invitation to, hey, uh, exactly. listen, you're relating to temper this way. Yeah. Listen, you're relating to palm trees this way. Hey, Marina, did you notice how you relate to men and to power by diminishing yourself and disappearing? And yeah. it doesn't feel open and spacious and possible yeah. it feels completely constrained and small and huh. so you see the feeling mm. is inviting me to look at what i am doing how am i relating to the thought of men temper palm trees hold on a second i am looking at this in a way that might not be useful if i want a beautiful relationship with a guy or if I want to go on vacation to Costa Rica, or if I want to, you see? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Because this week I just saw something that if it like hurts a bit, then there's something new to see there. Yes. Yeah, it's an invitation. Exactly. That we're talking about. Yeah, it was so beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. Everything we feel is telling us about what is going on here whether it's thinking in the moment or thought system, a belief system that we are experiencing life. And ask ourselves whether we want to question it. And that's our free will, right? That's the free there you will. Go. There you go. So another way, in another, another way of saying it would be, listen, life is going to allow you to scare yourself and limit yourself and constrain yourself, but it's going to hurt. So you're free to do it, but it has consequences. Mm. But you're free to do it. You're free to suffer if you want. <laughs> That's your free will. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Hannah. Beautiful question. Loved it. Mm. Loved it. it. It feels like it rounded the whole thing up, no? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it did very, very much what we talked about. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank uh, you, everyone, for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure, hmm. really. And uh, thank you, you Marina. Yeah. Yeah. Let the new year begin. <laughs> yes.